just for being here today with us and, and worshiping with us as we celebrate fathers today and the gift that you are to us from our Heavenly Father, and just what a joy it is to be with you and to have you in our lives. And for those of you that are maybe even just grieving the loss of your dad, um, what a joy it is to know that our Heavenly Father knows you and sees you and loves you in the midst of that. And so we just, yeah, just want to wish you a happy Father's Day as we have this opportunity to worship this morning, to come before the Lord and glorify his name. If this is your very first time with us, especially want to welcome you. Uh, if you uh, are, have been worshiping here maybe once or twice, we would love to be able to connect with you. And so if you haven't been able to connect with our ushers because we don't have the connection cards, we would love for you to talk to one of our ushers so they can write down your information so that we can stay connected with you uh, during this time and we can get you on our email list to keep you updated with a lot of things that are going to be happening now that we're getting ready to enter the green phase. And so with that in mind, I want to let you know about two things that are really important that are coming up. First of all, August 15th, you want to write that down if you brought something with you. Um, August 15th, we're going to be having a family fun day where we are going to be meeting out back and we're going to be uh, celebrating and just having fun with families and, uh, and just spending time with people in our community with uh, all sorts of different attractions and food and crafts and all sorts of different things again on August 15th. And then the following week on the 23rd of August is our church family picnic, which we're going to worship here and we're going to be out back in our back lawn on August 23rd, an opportunity for us just to celebrate as a church family and to be together as a church family. And, and that's just so important during these times. And so I want you to write down those two dates as we celebrate and as we think about you know moving forward and God being faithful and providing for us as we kind of work our way through these days difficult times. As we come into worship this morning, one of the things that I was talking to, to some people about yesterday was just this idea that um, do we come into, into this place, do we come into worship with an expectation that we're going to meet God? You know, or do we come into this place and just say, you know, well, I'm here, we're just going to check it off the box, and we'll do our thing, and God will bless it. And so I want to read to you from the psalmist, Psalm 62, and I want you to think about this and hear these words as we think about this idea that God desires to do something here this morning and he wants us to wait expectantly on him, to wait and hear him and listen for his voice. So listen with that in mind as we think about worship. The psalmist would record it this way, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I, ne I will never be shaken. So many enemies against one man, all of them trying to kill me. To them, I'm just a broken down wall or a tottering fence. They plan to topple me from my high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face, but curse me to their hearts. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for, he, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor comes from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. Twice the psalmist there says that he waits quietly before the Lord. There's this thing about waiting quietly, that when you calm your heart and when you sit, there's kind of this expectation that grows within us where we say, okay, God, we know that you're here and you want to do something. And so my prayer for us this morning as we pray and as we open is that you would just quiet your heart before the Lord and just simply pray quietly to yourself, God, whatever you have for us this morning, would you allow it to be done? And would you help me to get out of the way that your Holy Spirit would make it happen? So let's pray with that in mind as we worship the Lord this morning. Father God, I just ask that in the quietness of this room, that you would help us to just wait quietly on you. That you would help us, Father God, to say, God, we expect you to do something. We want you to do something. We are here to meet with you. We are not here just to check this off the box, but we are here to hear your voice, to sing praises of response to you because you are worthy, to remind each other of who we are as the body of Christ, to build each other up, to affirm one another, to convict even one another, God, that we would hear your voice and we would leave here taking forward the gospel. And so, Father, we wait quietly on you. May you be worshiped this morning. May you be glorified and honored. May you show up in a way like never before that as we would leave this place, we would say, yeah, our dad showed up and we are so excited 
about what you're doing in and through us as individuals and as the corporate body that is indwelled by your spirit. We love you. We thank you for loving us, and we praise you and give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we're going to get ready to worship, and so would you stand and worship with us? Good morning, church. Sing with us. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone, word is our only confidence, that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand.
before you, just giving you all the glory and the praise through these words that we have sung. Father, we are grateful that you paid my debt. We're grateful that you paid everyone here and those that are listening. You paid their debt. Lord, how grateful are we? How grateful is this heart that you poured yourself out for us, that you showed love unconditionally no strings attached, and that you still thought of us and went forward on that cross. So Lord, we declare today, Lord, that we have laid down our own very lives, Father, to live fully, fully for you. We live all out for you. Lord, now's not the time to slow down. Now's not the time to just relax. Lord, now's the time for us to live all out for you. So Lord, today, through our songs and through the spoken word, that we declare that we live for you and that we are grateful that you have loved us. So Lord, meet us now in this moment when we hear your spoken word, that it would penetrate the hardness of our hearts, would reach deep, that when we leave this place, we will leave differently and we would live differently. Lord, I'm grateful for this morning, I'm grateful for this time as the body of Christ joins together to sing your praises. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, it is a joy to be here with you this morning as we have the opportunity to read God's Word and to study it together. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 14 as we continue in our series on the Gospel of Mark following the servant king. Uh, we're going to be specifically looking at the Last Supper this morning, uh, and so I'd love for you to turn there with me. Uh, as we prepare to go into the Word this morning, I do want to just share some family uh, news with you. I think it's really important for us as a family of believers to just make sure that we're communicating really openly and transparently about things that are happening in our congregation, uh, because we are a family, and we want to make sure that everybody kind of knows what's going on. Uh, and so as we think about that, I just want to let you know that the ministry council met um, a couple weeks ago and we gave the trustees permission to look into uh, making some changes to the property for the safety and security of, of our individuals and especially our children. And so uh, if you, um, in the next couple of weeks, come into the, the building and things, you'll start to see that we actually approved the uh, painting of some lines uh, on the parking lot as, as you're coming in and, and out of our driveway here and some, um, some signs as well, just again, to take care of, of you as you're coming in and out of 
of our property. You'll, you may not know this, but throughout the week, people love to use our parking lot as a shortcut. I, I, don't th- I think they're gaining like probably three seconds, um, and I recognize that three seconds to some people is really important, but um, they're, they're not gaining a whole lot of time, but yet they're still using it. And so our, our desire as, a, as a, a leadership team is to say to our people, look, we love you, we love your kids, and we just want to take care of you. And so you're going to see some changes as far as directional arrows in our driveways and some signage to just say uh, no throughway. We're not going to say private property because we want to make sure that our people realize and our community realizes like this is a place for everyone to come and meet the Lord and to be able to worship with us. Uh, one of the other things you're going to see is, is over here between um, the Parsonage and the Hildebrand's house is we actually approved uh, the installation of a speed bump um, because I don't know if you know this, but between the Hildebrand's and, and uh, the Kirks who lease our, our uh, parsonage, there's nine kids, okay? And we love those nine kids, and we love the kids that, that don't even live on our campus and run around and, and do these things, and so we need people to slow down, and one of the ways that we thought we could do that was to, to make them slow down, right? To force them to with a speed bump, and so that's going to be installed. Um, and, and then the other thing that we're going to do is you'll notice, and this may take some uh, time to get used to, but we know that our, again, our desire is to take care of our kids, to take care of those people that are worshiping with us, and, and to make sure that we are providing uh, the best for your safety. And so one of the things that you'll also notice is we're going to take our carport and we're going to, t- to make it an exit only. You'll no longer be able to enter the parking lot from the, the behind the sanctuary here and come through the carport because, again, if you step out there, there's kind of a blind spot and, um, and we want to make sure that we're providing for your safety. And so that's going to happen. Um, some of that's going to be happening by the end of this month in the next week or so here. And then some of that, like the, the speed bump, might take a couple more weeks uh, just to be able to get that done. But we wanted to just inform you uh, about that so that when you see those changes, you're not wondering what's going on. If you have concerns about that or you have questions about that, I'd love to talk with you and try to give you some of the rationale behind that uh, and try to help you understand that. Uh, but uh, we're, again, we're just trying to take care of our kids, take care of our families, take care of you as, as individuals who are a part of our family because we love you and we want to make sure that you're safe and you're okay here. So just wanted to let you know about those things. All right, we're going to jump into God's word this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd I'd ask that you look at Mark chapter uh, 14 this morning. As we're going to read, I'm going to read to you uh, Mark chapter uh, 14, verses 17 to 26 as we get started this morning, as we're looking specifically at the Last Supper. And if you're watching uh, at home, live on Facebook this morning, I'd love for you to start to comment. Here's a question for you as we think about um, reading this and looking at this is, what would you eat as your last as your last meal. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would be your last meal? Okay, let's jump into God's word and then we'll, we'll talk through that. So here we go. Look at verse 17 with me as we jump in here. It says this, in the evening, Jesus arrived with the 12 disciples and as they were, were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked him, am I the one? He replied, it is, one of you, it is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me, for the Son of Man must die as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better that that man, that, that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray together as we go before the word of the Lord. Father, Father, our our prayer this morning is that we would hear your voice, and uh, Lord, I recognize today is a a day where we celebrate dads, and we celebrate just uh, family in general, and and, uh, a lot of us might have things on our minds that are are going on for later today, uh, and, and I just ask God that you would calm our hearts, you would calm my heart, God, that you would help us to hear your voice, Father. We recognize that you indwell us who believe by your Spirit. And so help us now, Holy Spirit, as you indwell us as individuals and as a corporate body, that we would hear your voice, that we would not be distracted, but that we would really dig into the, to your word and examine our own lives through this, the truth, Scripture, your voice. 
and that we would then respond in obedience and worship and gratitude to a God, to a Father who loved us so deeply he sent his one and only Son. And so speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, as you're thinking about that, you know, what, what, what would you, if you knew that tomorrow was your last day, what would be your last meal? I mean, what we're reading this morning is called what? It's called the, the Last Supper, right? Like, did you ever think about that? Like, the fact that we call this the Last Supper, not many people sit and think about this idea that, you know, this is actually Jesus' last meal, right? This is his last meal. So if, if, if you had to choose what would be your last meal, what would you pick to eat as your final meal? You know, if you go and Google that, you'll actually see articles written about the, you know, people that are living on death row and how, you know, if you don't know this, that if you live on death row and you're going to be executed, that you can actually choose what your last meal is. And some people chose like things as simply as like a small piece of meat and an olive all the way up to like a lobster and all sorts of different other things, right? Because they have the ability to choose. What would be your final meal if you had to choose? For me, it's really easy. I'll be real honest. Chicken and waffles is amazing, Okay. And, and so for me, it would be chicken and waffles. It would be chicken and waffles, and then I'd probably eat some sort of dessert. Actually, it would probably be either cookies or maybe my mom's um, um, chocolate cake with her white icing, which is like to die for. It's not really a pun, but you know what I mean. Um, it, it's amazing. And then I would probably... And then I would probably eat some sort of candy because you know me, I love candy. So I'd probably like maybe, maybe circus peanuts or something like that. Now I know somebody that, that will kill you. That's like life to me, okay? That's a gift from God, let's be honest, okay? That's probably what I would eat. What would you eat if, if this was your last meal and you had to pick something? As we read here in, in Mark chapter 14, we see that the Passover meal has come. And if you read a couple of verses above where we read already this morning, you'll recognize that Jesus has a, discuss, a discussion, a conversation with two of his disciples as they pre prepare the Passover meal in Jesus' honor. Right, that Jesus shows that, that he knows exactly what is coming. As we've talked about before, he knew that he was about to die, that he was going to be betrayed, that he is going to be turned over, that he is going to be put on trial, beaten, abused, and eventually crucified and killed, right? We see that he even has foreknowledge of what's going on here. As he has this conversation and says, look, you're going to see a man, and that man is going to show you a room, and all you have to do is ask him or tell him that the teacher needs a room, and he will show you exactly where to go, what room to have this meal. And if you look there at Mark chapter 14, verses 14 to 15, you'll see that. He says this, at the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest house where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? And he will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So Jesus understands exactly what's going to happen. He understands that this is going to be his last meal. This is going to be the last time for him to spend with his disciples, eating with them, celebrating with them, worshiping with them. And he says to his disciples, go and find this man. And go and use the guest room. Now, to us, this is, kind of seems weird. Could you imagine some strangers coming up to you and saying, well, the teacher needs a room. And you're like, so? <laughs> Great. What do you want me to do with that? But we recognize, culturally speaking, that hospitality in the ancient Near East and even in the Middle East today is totally different, as we've talked about before, than what it is in American culture, especially during the time of the Passover. And so during the Passover, as we talked about last week, that, that, the, that the, the city of Jerusalem would grow by leaps and bounds by, by hundreds of thousands of people, there was this expectation, there was this understanding that you would open your home to those that would make a pilgrimage into this city. That when the Passover is happening, even if you didn't know who they were, if they came to you and they said, we need a room, that you would open up your home to them so that they may celebrate with you or they may celebrate the Passover meal in your home. And the, the, the name teacher here, as we see, that the disciples call him the teacher, would actually give him a little bit of prestige, right? That that title would say to this, this uh, person, hey, the, the teacher, the leader, our, our Savior needs something. And they willingly open up their home. 
Now, let's be honest. When we think about the Last Supper, what do you think about? You think about going into a room. You think about going to a place where Jesus is seated behind a table with uh, 12 other people, so 13 people in total. And we, what do we picture? We picture that famous last painting, right? That picture of, of the Last Supper, like they're a, a wedding party, and they're all sitting on the same side of the table and not looking at each other. When was the last time you went to a dinner and you were invited into somebody's home and they said, hey, we want to have you over for dinner, but we're all going to sit on the same side of the table and not look at each other? Awkward, right? That, that, that doesn't happen. And we read this and we read this and we go, we go well, that's, that's kind of what they do. We, we picture that because that's what's been portrayed to us. And yet what we understand is this room was, a, was a, a, a kind of a secondary addition to the home that was used for a guest house or a place for people to rest or whatever. And it's, it's most likely actually smaller than the rest of the home. And, and in fact, when they would go up and they would eat this meal, it was probably a little cramped because there was 13 of them. Yes, it says large room, but this isn't like an open floor concept in our homes here, okay? This isn't 21st century America. It, we're, we're talking about a, a, just a, a room on top of a home that probably has a table in the middle of it, and they're going to sit together, and they're going to be very intimate. There's 13 of them. They're going to share a meal together. They're going to spend time together. Right? When you invite someone over to your home, what, what are you portraying when you invite someone over to your home? You're saying, look, we want to get to know you better. We want to we learn more about you. We want to spend time with you. We want to hear your stories. We want to hear about your kids. We want to hear about some of the bad stuff even. We want to we pray with you. We want to affirm you. We, wanna, we just want to spend time with you. In the Jewish culture, it was much the same, if not even Deeper, right? It's this understanding that in the Jewish culture, if you ate with someone, if you drank from the same cup, if you spent time in a meal with them, it was saying, I, I am with you. We are deep friends. I am loyal to you. This is why Jesus got in so much trouble in the New Testament when he was eating meals with sinners, right? Because in, in, in eating meals with sinners, the, the Pharisees, the experts of religious law, would look at that and go, whoa, 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 if you're eating with these sinful people, that means that you kind of affirm them. That didn't make sense to them. But what we recognize is that Jesus was spending time with them because he affirmed that they were valuable people. They were valuable because they are inherently made in the image of God. And that gave them deep value and he came to save them, right? And so here we have 13 people, the 12 disciples and Jesus gathered around this table and they're eating and they're sharing a meal and they're drinking and they're having a wonderful time together. And then we read there in verses 17 to 21 these words. Words that would be confusing and shocking and bewildering to Jesus' closest friends. The words where Jesus says, in the middle of a meal. I mean, think about this. Think about if you are a follower of Jesus and you are eating with him and all of a sudden he turns to you. One that has given up everything. You've given up your house. You've given up your family. You've given up your business. You've given up social status. I mean, you're basically homeless. And Jesus looks at you in the middle of a meal when you're probably having a great time and says, one of you will betray me. What, what Jesus? Are you, are, are you kidding me? That's why, that's why we read here, again, if you turn there with me, we read there that as he says that, they're, they're like, what? what? What is going on there, Jesus? Jesus, are you kidding me? That's why we read there, all, all of them, every single one of them is sitting there in their own hearts and then eventually out loud looks to Jesus and says, Jesus, Am I the one? Jesus, is it me? Am I the one that's going to betray you? Have you ever gotten in trouble or at least been called before someone where they, they, they're like, look, we have an issue, and, and you didn't see it coming at all? What goes through your mind? Please rule me out of this. Just please, please, I'm begging you. Help me see this just as I'm, like, I'm just a witness. He's not actually talking about me. If we look at the Greek of, of, this, of this account, what we see is it's actually in the negative form when they say, is it I? Is it me, Jesus? It's this understanding that disciples are just begging the Lord to say, can you rule me out, please? Can you just affirm in me that it's not me, that I am not the one? Can, they're trying to save their own skin here. Right? Like, can you just please tell me right now that this is not, I am not the one. Please, Jesus, is it me? Am I the one, Lord? 
We don't really like self-evaluation, do we, or self-awareness, do we? I mean, when was the last time we sat down and listed out our growths and our strengths and our weaknesses and, and those things? When was the last time you as a person actually did that? When I was uh, in, in seminary, uh, I took a class on um, pastoral leadership, and it was all about how to work with the, uh, within the, the kind of the, the political structure of church. Imagine, imagine having a class like that, like on the governance of church and how that works and, and learning who the personalities are in church. I, I took a class, I promise you. I, pastors, they do lie. I'll, I'll confess that, but they, they try not to, right? Um, so, so we took this class... And we learned how to work through and talk about this. And one of the things that we had to do is we actually had to write out this survey and hand this survey to people around us. And it was all about self-awareness. Learning more about who I am as a person. You want to talk about feeling awkward? Feeling totally exposed. So I was a, I was a youth pastor uh, at this time. And so I had, I think it was like 20 different people that I had to hand this out to. And so I picked 20 different people from all different age groups, some parents, some leaders, all of these different things from this church that I was serving at. And I remember getting those back and, and some of them reading them and a lot of them just being like, yes, like I'm doing a good job, right? And reading it and being like, this is awesome. They actually like me. Can you believe this? These people actually like me. And I can remember just being totally affirmed, but then I can also remember turning other ones and hearing things like, well, he dresses like a youth member, so I guess that's okay. You can talk about cutting to the heart and starting to question, like, is that okay? Am I right? Are they questioning? Do they not think I'm responsible enough? Or hearing one that said, I think he really struggles with distraction that when I talk to him, he doesn't really look at me. I feel like he's got a hundred things going on in his mind and he's not really listening to me. Those aren't fun things to hear. I mean, you would talk about just feeling broken and questioning, okay, God, what is going on and is that really me? I mean, we don't like to be self-aware to the point where it actually hurts, where it's painful. And yet, can I confess to you this morning that when I heard those things, it made me evaluate who I am and start to kind of make changes and realize that I am one of those people that is constantly having things run through my mind that when I'm talking, I need to sit and stop and go, okay, good Lord, help me to be present with this person right now that I wouldn't be thinking about the to-do list of things that I have to do the rest of the day, that I wouldn't be considering all of the things that haven't gotten done yet, but that I would be actively present with this person right now. You see, as we read this narrative and we hear this understanding of Jesus saying, one of you will betray me, and they all question, is it I, Lord? They're questioning it because in their hearts, they're not sure, they're not self-aware enough to say, Am I really going to stand firm in my faith? And Jesus understands exactly what's going to happen because what? If we read down just a little bit further, what does he say? He says down just a little bit further in that passage that all of them will actually be scattered and leave him. They will desert him. That even Peter, this brash guy who actually lops off the ear of one of the soldiers and says here in this narrative, says, actually, Jesus, no, no, if everybody else deserts you, I will stay with you. I will go to the death with you. And he's like... Peter, come on. You're actually going to deny me. You're, you're going to say that you don't even know me. Do we come to this recognition, or have we ever just sat before the Lord like these followers of Jesus and ask this question, Lord, is it I? Is it me? All throughout this series, we've talked about the difficulty of faith and the struggle of faith and our need to recognize that persecution and suffering and difficulty is a way of life as followers of Jesus Christ. But when was the last time we actually sat down and said, am I completely sold out that I'm willing to suffer like that? When was the last time we willingly sat down and became so self-aware that it was our sin that drew Jesus to the cross? It was ours. And we are now called to remain faithful and steadfast no matter the cost. We must always ask this question, Lord, is it me? Is it me, Lord? Have I done this to you? And let me tell you, when you do that, it's not fun. It's not easy because two things will happen. One is you will hear the words, 
Yes, it is you. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is working in your heart and moving in your heart and convicting you of your sin. We look at conviction as if it's a terrible thing, but it's actually a wonderful gift from the Holy Spirit. That if we truly sit down and consider this question and say, is it me, Lord? Is it I? Have I turned away from you? You will most likely hear, yes. That we live in a day and a culture where our lives at times confess to the people around us that maybe we aren't even following the Lord. I mean, when was the last time you had somebody come up to you and say, what makes you so different? Are we self-aware enough to recognize that for many of us, myself included, we shy away and we live our lives as if we're, we're like everybody else. Is it I, Lord? Is it me? God's desire is for us to ask that question. And yet when we ask that question, come to this realization that although we hear yes, there is also an, a, a kindness in that voice that says yes, but you are loved and forgiven and redeemed. That even Peter, who denied the Lord and walked away from the Lord and said, I don't even know him, sat on a beach with his Savior after the resurrection, and Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Of course, Lord, I love you. Then lead my sheep. That when we hear yes and that conviction, we don't want to shy away from it. We want to run into that conviction because the Holy Spirit is moving and working and reminding us of who we're called to be. That we're not supposed to look like everybody else. That we're not supposed to act like everybody else. That we are supposed to be proud and faithful and true to the gospel. And that when we have fallen, he says, I love you. I've forgiven you. Go take care of my people now. Be who I have called you to be. You see, that's the beauty of the second portion of this scripture is that we then have this uh, calling on our lives to be reminded of our salvation, of who we are on a daily basis that we would live truly for him. So look there with me at Mark chapter 14, uh, verses 22 through 26 as we look at the communion meal, right? As we look at the Lord's Supper, the sacrament that the Lord inaugurates, inaugurates for the very first time with his disciples. He says this, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it and he gave it to them and they, drank, they all drank from it and he said to them, this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink Wine again until the day I drink, I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then they sang a hymn and went to, out to the Mount of Olives. Have you ever recognized the, the deep connection between our senses, between our, our five senses and memory? The other day, I, I was walking into the, the Hildebrand's house, and I don't even remember why I was there. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I can remember things long ago. I can't remember things like, what, like, what did you have for lunch yesterday? I don't know. But can, do, you, do you realize, like, like, how closely these things are tied to deep memory? So the other day, I was walking into the Hildebrand's house, and uh, as I walked in, there was this song playing. This song was, was by a guy named David Gray. Now, I don't listen to David Gray. I listen to Christian music and country music, both of which are a gift from the Lord, I, I promise you. Okay? And I was listening to this music, and as soon as, I, as soon as I heard it, as soon as I heard it, I was back in my dorm room at Penn State. My best friend in, in middle school and high school and, and college, we, we grew up together and we ended up going to Penn State together and we, we roomed together. His name's Joel Schock. I just love him to death. And, and he listened to David Gray. And so whenever I hear that song, it doesn't matter where I am, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, immediately. I, I could close my eyes and I could see my bed. I could smell the, the room, which by the way, it smelled good because we were both very clean. And, 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 and I, can, I, can even, I can even picture looking down and seeing the color of the carpet in our dorm room. Has that ever happened to you? 
Like where when you hear something or when you taste something or when you smell something, how it's just that linked to memory, it just draws you right back to that moment. It's not always good things that happen, though. When I was in elementary school, my family and I, when I was growing up, we would always camp. That was how we did vacation. We would go all over and we would camp. And so I can remember when we were in elementary school and uh, we went to Virginia Beach. And we camped in Virginia Beach and we had a great time. But I'll tell you this, we had such a good time, but I, I, don't, I don't really remember that trip. I don't remember that trip because I can remember coming home, uh, driving into the parsonage at Bridgeville EC Church down in Narvon, Pennsylvania, where my dad was the pastor, and driving down 322 and seeing the parsonage from a long distance off and him just kind of slowing down and seeing plywood sheets on our roof and him just saying, we had a fire. And walking into those rooms And to this very day, if I smell the scent of water and smoke or water and fire, no matter where I am, I remember walking into my room and everything just being gone. I remember seeing my my dresser as a pile of charcoal about a foot high. I remember uh, seeing my Eagles helmet. You remember those Eagles helmets that back in the 90s you bought your kids and they would run into each other like idiots, right? Like, I, I remember seeing my Eagles helmet as, a, as a, just a flat cake of, of melted green plastic because everything that my brother and I who shared a room, it was gone. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what's going on. As soon as I smell it, I'm right there. You see, that's what the Lord is doing here. We see this communion meal, and it has become something that we do as a sacrament. And don't get me wrong, I think we recognize the purpose of it, and I think we honor it, but we forget, we forget why he did this. He did it so that whenever they would eat bread, that whenever they drank wine, they are constantly reminded of the suffering of Christ. I mean, think about it for a second. As we read in the New Testament, what is the thing that they eat most in the ancient Near East, even to this day? What is the thing that whenever you go around the world, you can always find? It's bread. It's bread. I mean, if we read the New Testament, we read what? The feeding of the 5,000. What, what did he multiply? Bread. The feeding of the 4,000. Bread. When his disciples are in the boat and they're freaking out because they don't have anything to eat, and yet Mark tells us what? That there's one loaf present in the boat. Who is he talking about? Jesus, the bread of life. It's bread. And Jesus takes this bread. He takes this bread and he prays over it. He blesses it. We often read this idea that he blesses bread and we're like, what does it mean? What does that mean when when it says he blessed the bread? What he means is, is that in Jewish culture, when you would eat, there was this constant blessing. There was this constant prayer that you would recite. And so when we read this, what we read is of Jesus blessing it and and praying this prayer that was known by every Jew that as you would eat bread, you yourself, your family, you would pray this and they still do it to this day. The prayer is this. Praise be thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. Jesus takes this bread, this substance that they see every day, they eat almost every meal, he takes it and he holds it up and he says, praise be you, God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth breaks it, and he hands it to him, and he adds to it, and he says, but this, this is my body. This is my body, which is going to be beaten and bruised and whipped and eventually put to death. Here is my body. That word that we read there, this is my body, is actually literally translated, this is me. This is myself. Jesus says, when you break bread, may you always be reminded that when you hear the crack of that bread, when you smell the scent of it, may you constantly be reminded, taken back. Jesus suffered for me. He gave his life for me. He gave up his body for me that I may never forget. And he took the wine. He prayed a blessing over it. Praise be thou, king of the universe, who brings forth the grape 
or juice from the earth. And then he hands it to him and he says, this is my blood. This is my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of, of your sin. That, the forgiveness of your sin that confirming a new covenant between God and his people. That all who claim my name are covered in my blood. Your sins are forgiven. There is no more need for sacrifice. There is no more need for all of these things. I am finished. It is done. You are taken care of. That every time you would drink that wine, you would smell that scent, it would come back. That's why when we read the epistles, the letters in the New Testament, what does Paul constantly say? And others, that whenever they meet together, they break bread. And they share in the Lord's Supper. Why? Right back there. That they would never forget the salvation of their souls. That when they smelled that bread and heard it crack and when they tasted it on their lips, they were immediately drawn back to that memory of their Savior saying, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for you. We often read this and I think we look at Judas and we're like, well, if Judas didn't do that, Jesus was going to die no matter what. Why? Because it's the work of God the Father. It was going to happen because we needed to be saved. And it was the way to save us. It was the way to make a way for us to have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with God the Father. This was the way. Jesus is saying to Judas, you don't have to do this. There is another way. It's going to happen either way. And praise God that it did happen because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't be sitting here. But may we, may we as the people of God never forget our salvation. We go through the day and we, we, we go to the bank and we go to the office and we play with our kids and we do all of these things. And how often do you simply stop during the day and just go, Jesus, thanks for my salvation. If I'm completely honest, confession time, it doesn't happen often. Jesus ties this to the bread and juice, something that would always be used in his culture so that every day, multiple times a day, when they would crack that bread, Jesus died and suffered for me. And the only reason I have life, the only reason that I'm being used is because of his suffering, is because of who he is and his willingness to give his life for me. Oh, people of God, would we never forget the gift of our salvation? That whether it's and as, sin, as silly as it sounds, that even today, can I just confess to you, I longed, as I was writing this sermon and researching, I longed to be able to just serve you communion and go, what we remember as the people of God. But today, and as silly as it sounds, today if you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you smell that bread, would you allow it to remind you of the brokenness of Jesus' body? That when you settle down and you have a glass of juice in the morning or whatever it may be, may you smell and, Jesus, you poured out your blood for me. You poured out your blood for me, Jesus. May we never forget the salvation that is offered to us because of who Christ is. Confirming a new covenant between God and his people. We are the people of God, saved, redeemed, rescued, made new because of the suffering of Jesus. And the beauty of this is, the beauty is that when we celebrate it, when we praise God for it, we not only remember what he's done, but we get to announce the fact that our king has won and look forward to that day when we together as the people of God Stand before him and worship him and drink of it together with him. That's who we are. This week I was watching uh, a YouTube channel called Memoirs of World War II. Uh, I, I love history. If you, if you don't know that about me, I, I absolutely love history. Um, and I, I love just uh, World War II history in particular. And so there's this uh, YouTube channel called Memoirs of World War II. And if you watch it... Uh, it's uh, stories of World War II veterans and all the things that they went through and how they suffered and the difficulties that they experienced. And it's just, just this beautiful ch uh, channel that just does these amazing videos on, on people who really sacrificed a ton for our freedom. But if you watch them, every one of them, as they follow through their stories, they come to the end when eventually the war was over and they were getting ready to come back home. And every one of them, every one of them would say this, 
more than anything, I couldn't wait to just go home and get back to the simple things, get back to the basics of life, to get back to getting off of a bus and standing before my door and hearing my mom say my name. Having my wife and my kids say my name. Now, why do I say that? We make life about so many things, and we become so busy as a culture. May we never, ever forget the simplicity of our salvation, the gift that we can always run home to, that yes, as we go to work, and as we play, and as we interact with our kids, and do all these things, may we never, ever forget to just simply stop and say, Jesus, without you, I'm nothing. Because of you, because of you, I have been saved, redeemed, rescued, made new, and one day, God, one day I will reign with you. May we never forget our salvation. So how do you live this out? Three real quick things. Three quick things as you live this out. One, would you take time to just have some time for self-reflection that you literally would consider, is it me, Jesus? Is it I? Is it me, God? How have I fallen short? How have I, how have I allowed sin to uh, creep into my life, and how do I continue to dabble in it? Lord, is it me? And be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's not a bad thing. It's a gift. Would you invite someone that you trust who knows the Lord to come into your life to not only affirm what you're doing, because we need that. We were, we were actually talking about that last night when I was with some friends. We need people to come in and to affirm, look, these are the things that God is doing in your life, and, and do you see how God is working? But, but can you also make these changes that you would grow to a deeper place? And would you journal about how you've changed because of Christ, that it would remind you of the gift of your salvation? That as you smell that bread, that as you take in that juice, that you would actively participate in the remembrance of the suffering of Christ, his broken body, his spilt blood, offer our salvation. Father, I praise you and thank you for this morning. Lord, you've saved us, you've given your life for us, and, and so often, God, we confess to you that we we take for granted our salvation. We, we live day in and day out, and it's like, it's like yeah, God, we, we just kind of go through the motions um, just because life is busy, and, and we know that that's just part of life. But Lord, may we never, may we never lose sight of the beauty of who you are and how you've redeemed us. That Lord God, our hearts would do nothing but praise you, God, that as we sit before a meal even today, and as we break bread, and as we share meals with our dads and with our loved ones around a meal, that God, we would sit and actively reflect and be reminded that, you know what, Jesus saved me. He saved me. He's redeemed my soul. That our souls, in response, would say, we praise you. We praise you, God, and we live with you. We live for you, whatever you desire, God. We praise you, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and praise the Lord. All right, church, let's celebrate. That silence is the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark, and it changes everything. We sing with all we are, we claim your victory.
busy life gets, that no matter how crazy the day gets and your, your kids are kind of driving you nuts at times and those sorts of things, that you would be constantly reminded of your salvation, that you would constantly remember the suffering of Christ, this beautiful image, the love that our Father, our Dad has for us as children. Father, we praise you and thank you. We praise you because of who you are and how you've redeemed us and saved us and made us new. And God, we just beg of you, Lord, today, even as we celebrate our dads, that you would help us more than anything to celebrate you, our heavenly father, Abba, Daddy, the God of all creation, who saw sin and brokenness and his children who desperately needed to be saved and sent his one and only son who would give his life as a ransom for many. God, help us to celebrate our sal salvation today and every day, singing praises to you, our God and King, that your name would be glorified and that others, God, as we praise you, would know you and love you and be redeemed. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. We pray you have a fantastic day. We are going to ask you to sit at this time, and our ushers will be there in just a second to dismiss you. Have a fantastic day.